welcome back to the When I Heard This Podcast. My name is Nate Robinsoff, and I'm here with Joseph Tillman. How are you, Joseph? I'm doing really, really good today. This, took, is, a, this is a good day. That took so long for you to say. Sorry? That was an even longer pause. <laughs> You're welcome. That pause was even longer. <laughs> So today, we are doing Jesus as the only way of <laughs> salvation. We just finished up a bunch of other Jesus stuff about when he was conceived all the way to when he ascended and uh, went into heaven, and then that he's coming back down from heaven again in a different way that time. So we finished with all that, and now we're talking about how Jesus is the only—what are we? what are we talking about? Yeah, like, is is he really the only way to God? That's really the question. Right. Is he the only way to God? And just to mention up top, we have a Patreon. You can go to patreon.com, uh, type in when I heard this podcast, and there's one tier. We've decided it's $5, and you can give there. All the money that we get there is going to go toward pushing the podcast on social media, and you can check that out. There have been criticisms of Jesus in the Bible I guess, from everybody else that doesn't believe in Jesus, that, hey, I think he was a guy that is in that book that could have existed, don't really care if he did or not, but that he wasn't special mm -hmm. compared to everybody else or at all in general. Yeah. So what is the Christian response to that claim? <laughs> <laughs> the Christian response. Okay, so yeah, I I understand when when people question like is he God and that kind of thing, right? I I get that that's that's a question. I don't think there can be much doubt that he actually existed. Okay, so I think there's not just the biblical evidence, but there's a lot of extra biblical evidence, just historical documents that Jesus actually did exist. Like, so this was a guy, he existed. You know, whether it's the writings of Josephus or others, like, okay, Jesus was a guy, he existed, okay? Like, I think that can be settled, Okay, all right? But I do understand the question from that point of, well, but, okay, Jesus existed. He was a guy that existed, that lived in this time period, and lived in this geographical area, but who was he really? Because the claim is that he's God, or son of God, so, but who is he really, and so I, I, I fully understand that. And so some people would say, you know, he's just a moral teacher, you know, good moral teacher, taught on morals, okay? Others would say, nah, he was maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe he actually was a prophet. Um, even other religions give space for Jesus being a prophet, you know? Okay. like So for example, I mean, Islam is not even denying Jesus' existence. They're denying his divinity. Okay. And so, uh, like, and I think that's probably a good evidence that Jesus actually was a guy walking around on this earth. I mean, other religions even affirm his existence. The debate centers around, but who was he? Okay. And so I think that obviously we would pull from scripture and we would say, well, if I look at this and this and this, that makes me believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God. But I also understand, again, that other religions would say, well, maybe he's a prophet, maybe like, in, maybe like in a similar vein as Muhammad, or maybe in a similar vein as Joseph Smith, whoever, right? That he was an individual, had divine understanding of some things, mm -hmm. but are we really saying he's God? I think that's like... But all the discussion basically comes back down to is like, well, is he God? Kind of way, one of the ways you can look at it is if he wasn't God, he was a terrible, then he was a horrible liar, right? Mm -hmm. Because he made, I mean, he made claims that he could forgive sins. He made claims that he was the I am. He made claim like when others would go, you're Lord or you're God, he didn't deny it. So like, you know, and so when they when he's about to be crucified, and they say, "Are you saying you're the son of God? Are you saying you're the son of man?" And he says, "I am who you said I am." Right? Or when they say, "King of the Jews," well, you said I was just like that. 
Yeah, just like that. Just like, just like that. And so, I mean, in other yeah, words. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever you <laughs> say. <laughs> you know? But like, no, but like he's not denying it, right? He's not denying the fact that that's who, you know, all right, you say that's who I am. And, you know, he's kind of playing word games a little bit with him. And I get that. But, you know, he's, he's he doesn't deny that he's son of God, that he's son of man, that that he is king of Jews. He's not denying that. He's not denying the claims that he's making of, of being God, of being the Lord of the Sabbath, of being the one who can forgive sins. These are all things that Jews would have said, only God could be this. So, only... if, so if he wasn't God, then he was a really stupid prophet. Yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, that's, yeah, he's a horrible teacher. Okay. And he's a terrible prophet. Okay. Right? So, I mean, so either he was just a flat-out liar, or maybe he was just crazy, Right. Like maybe he was just out of his completely out of his mind and just saying saying stuff, right? That wasn't mm. even true. And so, I mean, we've ran into all kind of people that just make crazy claims. Right. Okay. And so I guess he's either like a liar or he's out of his mind crazy. Or maybe the reality is maybe he actually is God. It doesn't make logical sense, I guess, for him to be anything other than actually god or completely insane we should ignore him completely yeah okay yeah that's completely what i believe because saying that he's a teacher well that'd be stupid right because he's uh, because he would have been horrible at it. yeah he's just lying okay apparently just making up stuff okay Right? right. I mean, because he's actually in his teachings, he's actually saying, well, you know, to the Jews, he would be saying, well, your your law says this or, you know, Torah says this. But I say as if right. he has the authority right. to go beyond that. Well, if he's not God, then he's crazy. Mm -hmm. Or, again, he's just intentionally lying. And so I don't know. Like, in other words, if that's the case, then we should just throw out everything he says. Okay. I don't think you can, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think you can take parts of it. Like, I'm either going to just disregard what he said because he was crazy or just a liar, or I need to take the whole part of it. Mm. Like, I do think that's one of the things that like, we have to wrestle with. Because, like, even other, you know, quote unquote, kind of revered prophets didn't make, they weren't making God claims. Right. They may say, well, I'm speaking for God. I believe God is saying this, but they're not making the claim that they are God. Mm. Jesus is making that claim, and his followers are all making that claim. I just think that that's one of the <laughs> one of the most essential parts of it. Like again, he's he's either, I guess, I guess he's either God or he's not worth paying attention to. Why is believing all of these things that we talked about in the last two episodes? Why is believing all of those? things the only way to heaven who said that jesus is the only way to heaven other than jesus i don't think you've got to have all of this stuff figured out when you begin to believe in and follow jesus okay right like i don't think you have to have all the virgin birth the uh, you know you know the who he was as a child growing up in wisdom and stature and that fact that you know, he was to even one of the words that would be used, you know, his incarnation, right? That God came and dwelt with flesh among humanity. Like, you don't have to have all of that stuff figured out. You don't have to have what did his death mean or, you know, what it was all involved in resurrection and what happened in between the death and the resurrection and what it looked like for him to ascend and when is he coming back? Like, you don't have to have all that stuff figured out. Mm -hmm. When you begin to believe in Jesus and begin to follow him, I mean, I know I didn't. Like, when I was 17 and I heard the gospel preached for the, you know, and I responded to it, put my faith in Jesus— like I didn't know all that. I didn't know all that stuff. I could have never articulated all that. What I did know, and this is kind of just that that experiential knowing. When I say no, that knowing that okay, Jesus is God, and I need Him, mm. and I need Him not not only for forgiveness, but I I, I need Him because it's like that's my Creator. I was I was meant to be with Him, right? I didn't have all of this stuff figured out. I just knew that Jesus was God, that Jesus had died for my sins, and that he resurrected. I knew that, but I didn't understand all the 
details of it, you know, or all the reasons of why even particular behind it, that I just knew those things were true. I put my faith in this Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? And not in all of these doctrines or things. I just put my faith in Jesus. And that's where I began to follow Jesus. And as I grew as a follower of Jesus, I began to, over time, begin to understand some of these things. So I don't want to sit here and say, you've got to have all of this stuff figured out to then follow Jesus. Okay. My faith is just in, he's God, he died, he rose. Not all the intricate parts. Intricacies. No. Because, okay. I mean, I, I mean, I think there's, even people are going to debate about those intricacies, mm-hmm. right? They're going to debate about what was his death really, I mean, not really all about, like, like what all was entailed in that death? What mm-hmm. all was entailed in that resurrection? What all is entailed in his coming back? Like, those are points of, I think, of discussion and debate. The fact that he came, the fact that he was God that he died, that he rose, those are really not up for debate. The big broad, mm-hmm. that is ultimately what I'm putting my faith in, is in this person, not in these statements of belief or doctrines, if you were. This 100% God, 100% person yes. guy. Guy. Yeah. Yep. All okay. God, all man. All God, all man. Yep. What is faith in Jesus? Like, I get that that's a little... <laughs> the answer <laughs> is abstract, I suppose. But what is faith in Jesus, and what's the difference between believing in the death and the burial and the resurrection and all that, and and like having faith? Like I can believe that those things occurred, I guess, but do sure. I have faith, yeah, or, I, or is that faith in itself that I believe that those things happen? No, I, th- I think that's a really good question. There's a huge difference between like an intellectual understanding okay. of those things and faith, and so. And I'll define faith here in a second, but I think there's like I can intellectually say there was this man named Jesus. Okay, he was God. He died on this earth. He rose from the grave. I intellectually understand all those things, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to follow him. Or he did all those things, but uh, does it really affect my life? I don't really care, right? So I, I can even intellectually like under, not only understand it, but even maybe even agree to it. But that doesn't mean I have faith. So faith is more than just an intellectual assent. So faith is a, I think faith comes from the core of who we are. And it's this kind of core trusting, this core believing in Jesus, that he is God, that he did die, that he did rise from the grave, that he is coming back again. But I'm I'm trusting, I'm believing in Jesus from the core of my being in saying that, if I cling unto him, if I follow him, therefore I will be saved. Okay. I am okay. saved and will be saved. And because it's really more about this this relationship with God, right? That I'm entering into. Like we were designed, we were made, we were created for relationship with God. And this is the means in which I can have this relationship with God. Okay. And so, yeah, so I would describe it as it coming much more from like the core of our being than just this intellectual assent or intellectual agreement with some statements. Okay. None of that really makes much sense to me, but maybe I'll figure it out later. (laughs) Why not? What does it make sense? Like, I don't, I don't know where the core of my being is. Okay. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know how to locate that. And I suppose I'm using my brain to try to find it. (laughs) But <laughs> well, no, I don't think it. I don't. Okay, so let me be clear. I don't. I'm not meaning that it is not in that your intellect's not included in that. Okay. Right. Like, but it's 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 more than just your intellect. Okay. So from my intellect, from my because when 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 they when the Jews, for example, you just say the heart. Mm. Like, there's no differentiation between the emotions and the intellect. And the will, like those are all wrapped up together. Okay. And so when, when we say that the heart, that's what we mean by the core, the heart, the, the center of my being, like, I guess like from the deepest place within me, from that, that, you know, from that deepest place of, if you want to put it, knowing that, trusting, believing, whatever it may be from that place, I'm putting faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I can force myself or even a, do it like by myself like it even requires god to empower me to do that okay but yeah but yeah but by his grace by his empowerment 
I have this revelation. This is who Jesus is. And man, I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to Jesus, trust in Jesus. And it doesn't mean that, and I don't want to get into this point of like where every single second I'm questioning, am I still believing from the core of my being? Am I still trusting from the core of my being? Right. But okay. like, you know, cause like, I think we can get those, <laughs> those parts of like, well, I've messed up right now or I'm not following Jesus in this second. Or I'm not looking like Jesus in this moment. I must not trust him from the core of my being. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to get us down that road where that's where we're starting to say like, no, is he God? Did he die? Did he rise? Am I trusting him? By trusting in that, I am clinging unto him, holding unto him, and will actually be with him. And intellect, emotions, and all that are wrapped up in it. And I know consistently over the course of my life, not or like despite what I, despite the bad action that I took today or the right. wrong thought I had or whatever, still down here, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm still yeah. trust. Yeah. Okay. And which is why I know I need to ask for forgiveness for the wrong thing I just did. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Did people that believed in God go to heaven before Jesus? Yes. Okay. How? Faith. But there was no Jesus to have faith go in. through. Right. But they had faith in God. Paul even talks about this in Romans chapter four. Okay. That even Abraham, for example, that he was you know, we'll use the word saved, but saved by faith. In other words, that his relationship with God, his eternity was secured by faith in God. Mm -hmm. And the reason that Jesus becomes an important part in this is because to once Jesus comes and does what he does to reject Jesus would be to reject God. Yes, Jews before Christ were saved through faith. I mean, Hebrews chapter 11 gives just this massive list of all of these individuals that lived before Christ that are now in heaven, that are now with the Lord. Okay. And it's all because they had faith. Like every, in every single instance, it was because they had faith. Faith has always been what has secured one's you know, eternity with God, to put it that way. Or to, you know, to have that, to recover that relationship with God that we were meant to have mm -hmm. between the creator and, the, and his creation. So they've always had that. But now on, on the other side of Jesus, on, and what I mean by that, on the other side of Jesus being here and his death and his resurrection, now our faith is, is in Jesus, which puts, which puts us in a right relationship with God. And so okay. there's not the... You know, it's not just I'm believing in God. I'm believing actually in the fact that God came mm. through Jesus. Jesus was God, right? So he came in flesh, lived among us. And therefore, now if we say, well, I believe in, let's just say it's this vague, abstract God, but I do not believe in Jesus. It, it, actually, you can't hold both those things together. Like to, because to reject Jesus would be to reject God. This all of this core of my being believe all this stuff that people argue over, mm -hmm. J you know, Jesus coming and changes changing everything, and and Jews aren't Christians now, and they're screwed, and and all of that. Uh huh. It seems like being a person of faith was a way easier back before Jesus came because all you had to do was kill it chicken and light it on fire <laughs> once a week and you were good and then you just went and did whatever um like that was your act of faith not all this i have to hold core of my being <laughs> jesus did all these things stuff right but there's still it just seems easier okay i see what you're saying all right so two things okay. number one jews still believe the core of their being okay that he was god that God was God. Right, but he had done stuff in front of them also. So it was a little bit easier to believe. But not for every generation. I guess. Yeah. I mean, not every generation saw the Red Sea parted. Not every generation saw the walls of Jericho fall down. Right? I mean, not every generation saw all that. Right. So there is the continuation of basically what you see in Deuteronomy is Moses encouraging the, the adults who have kids, hey, pass this along to your kids. 
pass these stories along to your kids of what God has done for us. Okay. So. And then the kids had to believe all that. Yeah, to believe it. And just had to accept it. Okay. And, and they may see miracles in some form or fashion in their own lives, or they may not. But it's being passed down. And same thing now. It's just being passed down. And I think... There are those moments okay. where we, be, like, we've seen miracles. We see God heal someone. And we've, you know, we've seen a life completely transformed by the power of God, and that's a living memorial, you know, if you mm-hmm. were. That's a that is a testament to who God is and what He's done. And so we still pass these stories along mm-hmm. of what God has done. But so they did believe in God, but when they didn't, is when they got in trouble. You know, when the people of God. We're not following the Lord mm-hmm. when they stopped believing from the core of their being, when they started to worship other gods, when they started to worship other idols, that's when they got in trouble. Every single time, that's why they got in trouble. Mm-hmm. And by trouble, I just mean that all of a sudden now they were reaping the consequences, not just of not following the Lord, but of just of, of making choices that they would not have otherwise made if they were following the Lord, right? And so now they're having to suffer the consequences of that. And so, I, and same thing happens today. Like, I'm going to believe Jesus, believe in Jesus from the core of my being. And there's still these stories, and these testimonies that encourages that faith and that we pass down. But it's still about faith at the end of the day, mm. it's still about holding on to Jesus, believing in Jesus, just the way the Jews believed in Yahweh. So I, so I understand that. But, but then secondly, also, it was really, the Israelites were always a people that were welcoming to foreigners to come alongside them and be considered God-fearers and to worship Yahweh, to worship their God. But it wasn't like this faith was just all over the world. Right. You know, so I think actually now, and I think that's one of the things Jesus was talking about, was that hey, now, like it's Jesus was like, it's better if I leave. Like, it's better if I ascend. It's better if I go. Because the Holy Spirit's going to come, and now you're going to go into all of the earth, mm. right? Where Jesus was confined to a geographical area, basically Galilee, Samaria, you know, Galilee in the north, then Samaria, which he didn't spend a whole lot of time with, and then Judah, or excuse me, Judea in the south, that was his geographical area. Now the gospel is going all over the earth, mm-hmm. which he said would happen in you know, Matthew twenty-eight and in Acts one eight. He, you know, he prophesied, "Hey, this you're going to go into all of the earth," and so now many more people are able to know God and to follow Him because the gospel is throughout the earth. Does it still seem easier? It just seems like a lot less to think about. Okay. The only thing I have to do to prove my faith is to light my animals on fire. <laughs> yeah, but okay, but I'll say this. <laughs> but if faith was not in conjunction with that, lighting those animals on fire meant nothing. I'm having a hard time. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with like I mean in other words if like, I do it, am I not showing faith? If you're doing it just because you think you're supposed to do it. Right. But then you live however you want to live, regardless. No, that's not faith. There's no faith involved in that. Okay. Okay. In a modern day analogy. Right. How many people come to church just because that's what they're supposed to do. They check it off their list. That's their quote unquote sacrifice to the Lord. They're at church for an hour on Sunday, but there's no faith connected to it. Right. Okay. It doesn't matter. Same thing with the animals. Right. But... But being at home and killing a goat is easier than going to church. <laughs> being at home and killing a goat is easier than going to church. <laughs> right? <laughs> it takes less effort. Does it? Does I it mean, really? I mean, if you don't care about the goat, it takes less effort. <laughs> I still go out there and kill the goat. But I guess you have to raise a goat and then right. to kill it. Right. So I don't know if it takes less energy or time, but regardless of the act of the goat, or <laughs> like if there's no faith attached to it, then both of those acts are meaningless. Okay. Okay. Well then let me rephrase. Okay. The way that I express my faith seemed easier back then uh-huh. than to, than now. Okay. Because 
But you had to go sacrifice things then. I don't have to sacrifice anything now. Yeah, but it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard to do. <laughs> yeah, but you're still having to follow the all of the moral law of of or yeah. all the or all the law of the yeah, but okay, so, law. so that also that's a whole lot more easier to, to understand than all this nebulous Jesus <laughs> stuff. Is it? I mean, okay, I get. It. I understand what you're saying. Do you it's get con- what I'm saying? It's like, concrete. It's written down and it's, it's more down, concrete. Right. It's easier to under, even though it's pretty strict. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, but yeah, it's pretty strict. It's pretty, pretty dense. Strict, strict stuff. Yeah. But, but knowing what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do is a whole lot easier uh-huh. than uh, Jesus drank wine. Right. Why can't I be wasted? Like, where's the line? Thinking all the the. Stuff like Jesus just complicated everything. <laughs> Jesus complicated everything. The new covenant is complicated. I don't think the new covenant is complicated. Because it's so nebulous. That's a good word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I understand. There's okay. a distinction between all right, the Mosaic law that the that that the Jews would have followed, right? right. Was was very concrete. Right. Okay. Do this, don't do that. Right. Or you die. <laughs> Right. In some instances, <laughs> if you didn't do certain things, yes, you die. Yeah. Okay. Not in every instance, but yes, right. in some. And so, yeah, there was, I understand that, co- the concreteness of that. Mm. I get it. But like Paul, I love the way Paul says it. Paul said that, you know, all of the law, so all of that law mm. is hinged on this one thing, he says in Galatians chapter five, love one another. Yeah. See, that's confusing. Okay. <laughs> Why is that confusing? Because because now I have to define what that looks like to love someone, right? Yeah, and there's nothing written about that. I mean, I guess there is, but you have to yep. pick it apart and figure out what it means. And Jesus said this, and Peter said this, and all, all the stuff. Yeah, but I think uh, I'll bet, okay to, to continue Paul's thought in Galatians, mm-hmm. right? He what he says after that is okay, love one another, right? But then he goes, the deeds of the flesh are obvious. And he just lists all kind of acts okay. that are basically what he's saying is these are the things that are unloving. Okay. Right? Like, and so he lists all these things that are unloving, which would, I mean, in, in many ways, if you're looking at the law, the Mosaic law, they're just, it's just echoing that in so many degrees. It's like, yeah, like, okay, for example, the Ten Commandments, right? Like, we're not going to steal. We're not going to kill. We're not going to covet. Yeah, but echoes are harder to understand than the first thing that you said. Okay. <laughs> I think that's my point. All right. So I guess what I'm saying is I think it's I, – I really do think that there's a concreteness. Okay, I'm looking at the law. It does help me to, to understand morally right and wrong. Mm. Okay? But I'm not, I'm not bound to every single part of that law. Right? I don't have to do the sacrifices. Okay. I don't need the priest, right, to be the mediator. To right. make the sacrifices for me, okay? All right, that part's easier. I'll give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> there's not all the civil law. That I can talk to Jesus instead right. of having there's, to go through And system. there's not all the civil law, like your boundary line must be with this stone, and if you cross this stone, right? right like, so it's like, all right, we're going to remove all that civil law and all the ceremonial, priestly, mm-hmm. you know, sacrifice law stuff. And then I'm just, it's just stripped down to just the moral law. Don't kill. Don't steal. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Paul's saying, listen, if you do this, like, that's that's loving. Like, if, like, if you don't, like, if you just abide by this law, you'll, lo- you'll love. You will love people. Like, this is what love looks like to do these things. Okay. And then he goes on to say, hey, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience, right? And, and kindness and gentleness. And if I'm this way with people from the Holy Spirit, that's an evidence of me loving them. So it's not only the things I don't do, but the things I should do in being gentle and in ensuring peace and or to the best that I can and, you know, to be kind. But like, how gentle, <laughs> how patient, how patient do I have to be? Okay. Like, can I be like, where's the, <laughs> I think you're wanting excuses to just go do stuff. No, I don't want excuses to just go do stuff. When I look at the old law and it's boring. Uh huh. Leviticus, right? Yeah, That's, I mean, yeah, yeah. You find the and you find the law numbers. in numbers, and you find it re- you, like a lot of it repeated in Deuteronomy, right? Yeah, 
That stuff is a whole lot. It's more black and white. Sure. Than how long do I have to be patient? Yeah. And so I spend too much time thinking about where these lines are when it was uh, a whole lot easier to just go <laughs> like, hey, don't have sex with your pig. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Like, that's easy. I won't do that. Right. <laughs> Instead of trying to figure out how patient I'm supposed to be with my right. pig. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I understand. No, okay. And I'll even say this. In Matthew 5, Jesus, like, basically kind of ups the ante on the wall a little bit, right? Okay. Because he's getting into what you're talking about and where it becomes a little more on the abstract level or nebulous level or not as concrete level, right? right. Because he begins to say things like this. The law says you shouldn't murder or kill. Like, okay, cool. We agree with that. That's pretty that's black and white. He says, but I tell you, don't have hatred in your heart. Yeah, see what? Yeah. So he, so I mean, yeah, so I, I see what you're saying. Like, in fairness, Jesus himself ups that, you know, like mm -hmm. he, he makes it, he makes us go beyond that. And I think what he's getting to, and what I was getting to, like with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, what he's getting to is it's not just about the outward things you do or don't do, it's about what's going on inside of you. Because Jesus is not just concerned about our actions. He's concerned about the, our whole being. Following Jesus in faith is not just about, you know, by grace and, in, and you know, through faith, it's not just about the outward actions I do or do not do. It's about him wanting to transform me into being like him. And so in some ways, I guess I will give you this. I don't think it's harder to believe in Jesus than to okay. believe in the other God or to believe in God, you know, before Christ. I don't think that's harder. What I do think is more challenging, and I will give you this, I think what's more challenging is now God is wanting to actually transform us to look like him. And that's more challenging. Okay. A quote-unquote good moral person can attempt to just do the right thing. Can still kill someone. Or go kill someone. But what God is wanting is not for us just to do the right thing, not to just be the good moral person, but he's wanting us to be transformed into his likeness, which is where that peace and that gentleness and that patience are all stemming from, right? Like he doesn't want us to have, he doesn't want us to have hatred towards someone. He wants us to have love some towards someone, mm -hmm. right? Um, he doesn't want us to actually, you know, steal or take from somebody you know no he says it's better to give than to receive so be a giver right so like what he's doing is he's actually coming and causing us to look more like him which is difficult because it goes against so much of what is naturally ingrained in us right and so i i'll give you that okay it is probably more challenging in the sense of because the longer i follow jesus the more and more he is refining me, if you want to use that phrase, to to look like him, and that is a that is a more challenging process. Okay. Yeah, but not to have faith. I don't think that's more challenging. But for people, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. For people that saw the miracles, it right. seems like that could be more challenging. For people that saw the Red Sea get parted, sure. That it's it feels like because. Because nothing like that has happened in recent recorded history. Sure. To be, to see those things, it's got to be easier to have faith than than now. You would think, right? But those same people that saw that wanted to abandon God. I mean, if you read the story of Exodus and Numbers, the same people that saw the Red Sea part later on go, "Man, God is forget God." All these, I mean, we're surviving on, you know, manna down here. You know, that's all we've eaten seemingly forever. Or God is, you know, like they finally get to the promised land where they're supposed to go. And they see what they perceive to be like giants. And they're like, oh, God's basically led us here to kill us. We don't want to go to the promised land. So they end up spending 40 more years literally wandering around a desert. 
until they get back to the promised land. And so just going in circles. Just, yeah. I mean, like, like a plane that can't land <laughs> pretty much. Okay. Like if you look at the geographical area, they're moving in. Like, you're like, wow, they spent 40 years there. <laughs> like, that's terrible. Like you guys, yikes. And the same. And, and, and if you read through Exodus and you read through numbers, you see all the complaints even made against God, made against Moses, who was leading them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that gum, I mean, Moses, I mean, they hadn't been out of the, they hadn't been out of Egypt for hardly any time at all. And the next thing they know, they're building a golden calf. Right. Because they want a tangible God to see. And I think that's getting actually to what Jesus is more interested in. What God knew, what God realized was that even in delivering his people, even in showing signs and wonders and miracles like this, it still wasn't enough to hold them continually to himself. In other words, he could hold them, but like they, they would let go of him. Mm-hmm. They would say, no, this is no, forget this. Like, let's just go back to Egypt where we were working seven days a week and being enslaved. Like no one, like you should think in your right mind. That doesn't, doesn't make sense, but that's mm-hmm. where they got to. And so, but it's because God had delivered them, yes, from their outward circumstance, but they had not been delivered from the inside bondage they had. And what more I'm more of the being stuff. Yeah, more their being. Right. Yeah. That's for so why, why Jesus is not just interested in our doing. That's why the Holy Spirit, you know, so the Holy Spirit comes and actually lives in us. He is actually wanting to do a transformation inside of us where we begin to look more like God and therefore walk in greater peace, walk in greater joy, walk in greater love. All the things we actually are searching for, Mm -hmm. right? All the things we say we want. Like everybody would say, I would like more peace. I would like more joy. Like everyone is on board with that. Including Miss America. Including Miss America. And, you know, we, we all would say those are positive things. And what Jesus is saying is, and I've got the ability to give it to you through my spirit within you, um, if you would just believe in me, if you would just follow me. So I understand the thought process of, man, if I could just kill a chicken once a week, I'm good, right? But but it's, but it's but he still hadn't captured their hearts. Not all of them, you know, <laughs> like they're, if I capture their hearts, I just, you know, I'm using that phraseology, but like. Just, I just mean like he, he hasn't like, they're not giving all of themselves to him, mm-hmm. right? They're doing an act and maybe moving on now. I mean, obviously a lot of Jews were not doing that. A lot of Jews were faithfully following the Lord, right? My whole point though, is just, I mean, there's something greater that's going on that the Lord knew he needed to do. And that's why he came. That's why the Holy Spirit has come after him. It's because he's doing something inside of us, transforming us. And I, and I know, like, I get it. Like, Someone's listening to this and they're immediately thinking of all these examples of horrible Christians that have done these terrible things and that are not examples of peace and joy and love. And, you know, I, I, I get it. I get it. But, you know, if, if we don't just look at the, the, the horrible examples, but if we're around people like a body of Christ long enough, I think we see that those things that people faithfully follow the Lord are actually evident. There is actually peace. There is actually joy. There is actually something there that we all inherently want within us and are, you know, scraping like crazy in this world to try to find. I think maybe there's even, I'll say this, I do think there's even more joy in following Jesus now than there would have been following God before Christ. Well, spending forever in the desert doesn't (laughs) seem fun. No. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when there was some people who were like, no, guys, like, <laughs> what? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 There was, there was, you know, like Joshua and his clan yeah. and Caleb and his clan were like, what are we doing? Right. Right. Because they got to go, right? Is mm-hmm. that the story? Okay. They sure did. Yep. And then the rest of them all didn't. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Why, why, why do I need grace? Like, why can't I just sin and deal with it and keep living my life? Okay, so if I deal with it, you mean what? I mean, like, if it's wrong, then I just go, yeah, whatever. And then, like, why can't I just forgive myself, I guess? Why do I need, Uh you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because most often our sins, our wrong actions, 
uh, most of the times it's not just against us, right? Like, right? A lot of times it's against others. So I can say, well, I forgive myself for being a jerk to that person. I, you know, but you still were a jerk to that person. And so now my sin is, my action has gone toward another person. Right. Not just toward me. And in so doing, I have been unloving toward someone else or toward creation and therefore have violated the very central tenets that God established his people around. Right. It was humanity and creation were all supposed to be, you know, in unity with each other. Mm. Right. And so when we are unloving toward creation or toward humanity, I don't know if humanity is part of creation, but you know, if, if we're unloving, then by default, that means we're breaking the very covenant that God established with us from the get-go. Grace is, is, I think grace is often confused with mercy um, or forgiveness. Okay. In other words, like they become like synonyms with one another. But they're not? They're not, okay. really. And because... Like when, when, when someone has, when God has mercy on us or when someone has mercy on us, like we don't get what we actually deserved uh, or we don't get the, like we're not receiving the punishment or the consequence of something that we deserve, right? We receive mercy. When we receive forgiveness, it's kind of the same thing in that sense. Like we're being forgiven of something. We don't deserve forgiveness. Like if I wrong you, I don't deserve for you to forgive me. Right. That's completely up to you if you choose to do that. Mm. And but I don't deserve it. There's nothing I've done to deserve your forgiveness. Like I could, you know, beg and cry and plead, but I still don't deserve it. You choose to give it to to me or not, right? Mm. So I, I can't earn that either. And grace is really is actually where mercy is like we don't receive what we deserve. Often we don't we don't receive the consequence we deserved. Grace is more the we are we are receiving a blessing that we don't deserve. So we're getting treated well despite being horrible. Yeah, basically. Instead of being treated mean or neutral toward. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because grace is so that's like one side of grace, right? Like one side is that like I am like when someone extends grace to me, mm -hmm. and they may be extending forgiveness. Okay. They may be extending, Hey, I want to, you know, I want to bless you with this or extending grace. But the other side of grace is not just the, you know, I, I, I received some blessing from the Lord or I received some blessing from someone else I didn't deserve, but grace in regards to the Lord is also like this empowering agent that allows me to even reach out to God. That it's an empowering agent that allows me to walk out in the power of God that he has for me to walk out in, to be who God has created me to be. So it gives me a power there. So when we say we need grace, I do think that every one of us because of the things we've done wrong, thought wrong, said wrong, generally speaking, directed toward other people, mm -hmm. we need, we do need grace. We do need forgiveness because we've acted in an unloving way towards someone. So before, before Christ, it was going back to your sacrificing of animals, right? It was based upon what I did, determined the sacrifice that I needed to make. Is that where like the confessions came from? Is it the same kind of concept? Um, it's, it's similar. Instead yeah, it's, of... it's similar. Like in other words, to go to confession, to receive the forgiveness for that act. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, like the idea of penance, right? So before Christ, I go, you know, sacrifice that animal, the priest would do it for me and I'd be forgiven. The beauty of Christ's death on the cross is that it takes care of all of that once and for all. Like I don't, there's no animal that has to be sacrificed. Um, I don't have to go actually do a confession to a priest to be forgiven. Right. Like I just ask the Lord to forgive me okay. and I'm, and I'm forgiven. And what that forgiveness is doing is it's not just dealing with my own action that has caused this chasm between me and another person or not as a chasm, but has caused a wrong between me and another person or was an unloving act toward me and another person. His forg he's forgiving me and he, in, in his way of, of forgiveness in Christ and his sacrifice 
So it, now there's just one sacrifice for one time for all of us. And in that sacrifice, all of our unloving actions fell upon Jesus. And so when we're saying, God, forgive me, he's extending forgiveness for something he's already paid the penalty for. Because without that, we would have to end up paying a penalty for our actions, right? So before Christ, it was the penalty of the life, the life of an animal, right? Was, was that sacrifice that had to be made for it. Now, because of Christ's death, he has become that one time for all sacrifice. And so I don't have to go do something to earn the forgiveness. I just simply receive forgiveness for acts that he has already died for. Because he's already paid the penalty for all sin coming on him. So I need grace. We need it, brother. I need grace because I needed. I need to be treated well despite being a piece of shit. But <laughs> you're... <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't use that phraseology, but what the I, what you're getting to is correct. Okay. Yeah, like despite my again unloving action, mm. okay, despite my being a jerk or my my whatever, I can be forgiven. And I didn't deserve that, but that's what is being extended to me. All of this stuff is very complicated or can mm -hmm. get very complicated. Sure. And convoluted and intricate and abstract at the mm -hmm. same time and all this stuff. So I guess I'm still struggling on how I deal with all of these things as a person who desires to continue being Christian. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and how I, uh, like, am supposed to tell people all of this, this stuff at once. Sure. If I'm going to do the thing that God wants me to do, which is tell other people about all this complicated, convoluted stuff. And <laughs> yeah. so I guess I'm looking at it in a way like I, I have so many I have so many questions per this podcast. So how do I deal with all this? Yeah. OK. Which is a question I feel like I keep coming to <laughs> the end of, <laughs> at the end of these podcasts. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I, I get it. And, like, and, I, and I agree with you. Like, if you just do a deep dive into, like, the intricacies, right, of all of these doctrines, of all of these events, it, it can seem complicated or overwhelming. And it may be complicated or overwhelming. I, 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 as, like, when I'm just trying to get my head around it mm. all for the first time, or if I'm trying to do a, oh, man, let's go deep into the Christ's death in regards to atonement and propitiation, right? Like I don't know what any of that stuff is. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you can go so far and so deep into all this stuff, right? Mm. So I get it. Uh, like, on a theological level, like, you can just go so far. But the reality is is I think what we do is we learn we learn things and we begin to understand things over time. And as we are we're in a journey of maturing in Christ, of being like Christ. So I don't have to have all of this stuff figured out. And I would never want like all the intricacies and all the you know the details to take away from the from the simplicity of the gospel. Okay. So I think that's what could kind of happen. It's like the gospel is really simple. Jesus God, he lived a sinless life, he died for us, and he rose for us, right? Like that's that's the gospel, mm -hmm. okay? And that if we have faith in him... From somewhere, <laughs> somehow. Somehow. Okay. If we have a trusting in yeah. him, okay, <laughs> that he is God, that he did die, that he did rise from the grave, we put our trust in that, that we would be with him, like that's the simplicity of the gospel, and I think we can get so caught up in all the other stuff and all the other jargon that it gets lost. You know, I, I, I just all I can do is reference back to where I was when I was seventeen and not really growing up in church, and then coming to know Jesus. And like I began following the Lord, not knowing like a uh, anything. If someone had come up and asked me about Jesus' ascension, I'd be like, "What are you talking about?" Like I, I wouldn't right. even know what that meant. If they came up and asked me. Well, why did Jesus die? I mean, like my only answer would have been for my sins. Mm -hmm. Like that's like that's it. Like that's all I had. You know, like or if someone had been like, "Hey, what happened in between the time Jesus died and three days later when he rises?" Like 
I'm like, I don't know. I've never thought about that. But it didn't take away from the fact that I had already begun to follow Jesus, right? Like I was a follower of Jesus at that point. Mm -hmm. And over time, I began to explore and learn and understand some of these aspects in a, in a greater and deeper way. But I, I don't want those things, again, to become so complicated that we think we have to have all this figured out before we respond to just the simplicity of the gospel, the gospel message, the simplicity of just who Jesus is. Okay, so I have a question. Okay. So this is not what I was trying to do, by the way, Okay. with this whole conversation. Okay. This is not where I was headed. I did not think this was going to happen. But when I have asked questions like this to people, mm -hmm. it always comes back to, well, I don't know any of the answers to your questions, but when I was five years old, my entire family killed themselves and I was sad and found Jesus and and now I'm here and you need Jesus too. Okay. So completely circumventing all of the questions that I have right, and going straight to one anecdotal story that I don't care about. Okay. So why do people do that? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Like, because I don't feel like that necessarily happened here. Like, I still am very confused about, not very confused. It's more, it's not as nebulous anymore okay. about what all this grace, faith, stuff is. core being yeah. stuff. Okay. When we're having this podcast, when we're doing this podcast together, mm -hmm. there is questions I have that get very answered that okay. I've never heard answers to, uh, before. Okay. But why do Christians do this when you ask questions like this? And I don't know why this conversation is making me think of it. Probably right. because it's very confusing. And I think you went into, well, when I was 17, well, like. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so it made me think about that. So yeah. what is the deal? Yeah. So now I hear what you're saying. So I think the questions are always valid, right? I think that's, I mean, we, we built the whole premise of this podcast on right. that, right? Like questions are always good right. and valid. And so. I think, unfortunately, for so many people in the church, they don't have the answers to those questions. Okay. They, like, if you were to talk to them about ascension or about atonement or, mm -hmm. right, they're going to look at you with blank faces and not really know how to answer that question. Now, I'm not saying everybody's that way, but a lot of people mm -hmm. are, right? If, if the stats are true and biblical literacy, like just knowledge of the, of the Bible— is at like 3% in our country. Most people are not going to have very good answers for those types of questions mm. because they don't know the Bible well enough themselves to answer those questions. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It doesn't mean they're not following Jesus. But it in somewhere, somehow, in their circle, their sphere, they have not had an opportunity to grow in their knowledge of the Word. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is... Like, I hate that for people. I hate they've not had an opportunity to grow in the word, mm -hmm. right? I was talking to uh, to someone late, to someone recently, excuse me. They were saying they were, they were in a congregation and they said for the first time, they felt like they actually are being taught scripture. They're in their 70s and they've been in their church their whole life. Mm -hmm. But they said, hey, the pastor we have now is actually like teaching the Bible. And it's the first time we've ever been taught like this. I think, unfortunately, that's that's true in a lot of cases, a lot of places. Like, we're not, and it's not just about the pastor, the you know, teaching the Bible. So I do think a lot of pastors are teaching the Bible, but like the challenge of going beyond that, the challenge of going, okay, not only am I going to teach the Bible, like for me as a pastor, like I don't want to just teach the Bible. I want my people to begin to get engaged with Scripture, you know, not just on Sundays, but during the course of the week as well. Like they're beginning to read Bible for themselves. And again, it doesn't make them theologians or give them all the answers all of a sudden, but it does begin to give them a biblical foundation and a biblical literacy as they continue to grow in it. So I think, unfortunately, what you're running into, Nate, is what a lot of people have encountered. A lot of people have testimonies and stories of what God has done for them, mm -hmm. which are important, but they've not been given the other side of being taught the word, okay. right? Like. I'm thankful for my experience that I had when I was 17 and coming mm. to know Jesus. I'm thankful at the same time that I was immediately placed into a Bible study on Thursday nights where I began to grow in the Word. And so actually my first year of being a Christian, uh, I read through the whole Bible 
in in one year, mm-hmm. and that's a like that's a that was a huge deal. To, it was hard to do that, but it was like I had never read it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about it, and it didn't mean I knew all the answers either. But at least I had a I was beginning to grow, right? And at least I had, and maybe it gave me actually questions to ask. Like I don't understand this. Help me understand it. I think there's just a way in which so many people have not, have not have not had that experience of being discipled and growing in the word. So all they're left with is just their personal stories and testimonies, mm. which again, I'm not knocking those. Those are powerful. They just should have been in context of growing in the word as well. Okay. Yeah. So for anyone out there that has had that same experience Nate has where people just aren't giving them answers, it's not always the people's fault. It's just the environment they're in is not encouraging that type of engagement with those types of questions or even with scripture itself on a personal level. So what do you think? About all of the, because we're, we're done with Jesus now. Next week is, what's next week? Next week's heaven and hell because I have yeah. to believe in heaven and hell. I hope we're not completely just done with Jesus. I hope we still like Jesus. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier for me to think that things occurred than understand faith. Like, I'll believe things happened. Mm-hmm. I can't wrap my head around faith, and I think that's the problem. I gotcha. And so, yeah, I mean, because you're believing like, in faith, you're believing in something completely unseen. Right. I don't know, like, <laughs> I said this before, I don't know where the core of my being is. So I'm yeah. like, I'm like, is that it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I just think it's yeah. our emotions, our intellect, our will, it's all in that core space. And and from that core space, you know, that's what we're saying. So, like, I think we are often separate okay. our, 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 our mind and our emotions and our will. And what I'm saying is the core would be like all that together. So it's like not discounting one or the other. It's all that together. So it's like a, what are those things called with the two circles and there's overlap, but it's all one circle? It's just one circle. Oh, they're yeah. all in there? They're all in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. then I guess I have faith, but I only guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah. because this literally is like one of the things I think about all the time. Hmm. Am I actually still faithing? So I think the simple question is like, do I believe that Jesus is God? Yeah. That he died on the cross, that he rose from the grave? Yes. And but I do- can't tell you where those yeses are coming from. So, That's but, the problem. No, but they're yeses. <laughs> and and then it's the next part is like, and do I trust that that is sufficient enough for me to be in a right relationship with God? I guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the, that's it, yeah. right? I'm Am I the only one that struggles with this, or is this... No. Nah. Okay. No, nah, I mean, that's why, like, throughout the Christians, throughout centuries, Christians have actually discussed, like, how do we have, secu- like, secure, like, an assurance of our salvation, right? Or Calvinists would refer, refer to it as, like, the perseverance of the saints. In other words, like, the, the security. Mm. Like, how do I have this, like, this security that I'm actually saved, that I actually have faith? Right. And so, you know, people have wrestled with that forever. All right, so, well, it's, so it's okay. Because I'll think about it and then I go, well, I guess I'm going to die and find out. <laughs> and and then I'm going to get there and be like, you're in. Like, well, you could have made me, you know, not worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I think we maybe worry ourselves too much about it in the sense of like, if we, if we have... Like if we, if we, if we believe and we trust and we're genuinely trying, right. I mean, like we're trying to follow Jesus. Mm. You're okay. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I think. All right. All the, all the beginning stuff though, from the last two episodes. I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but all the stuff from this episode is, I guess. <laughs> So, That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. As right. we move from the concrete to the right. not to the, concrete. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I get you. Well, this has been the one I heard this podcast. Uh, Joseph, sorry. <laughs> You're good, man. <laughs> You're good. I feel like this episode is going to be as nebulous <laughs> and as abstract as I felt it was. Right. When it's finished. <laughs> That's fine. All right. 
I kind of like abstract and mystery and all that stuff. I don't like it. I mean, I guess it's fun sometimes, but not when your life depends on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing we're talking about heaven and hell next week. Right. right. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I have so many questions. I know you do. It's I'm gonna, scared. It's going to be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be half horrible and half good. Mm. Was that good? Heaven and hell. Mm-hmm. Mm. And and maybe there's a a thing in the middle of them, but we'll ask that later. Man, I sure hope not. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's going to be part of that conversation. Of course. Yeah. Anyway, that was tease for next week. You can follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at When I Heard This Podcast. Uh, we also have a Patreon. If you would like to go to the Patreon and if you go to patreon.com and type in when I heard this podcast, there's a $5 tier there. All the money that we get there will go toward pushing this podcast out on social media. So if you believe in the conversation and believe in what we're doing here and want, think it's good for other people to listen to, then um, go there and do that. You can find the podcast on SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Rumble. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Nate Robinsoff. And you can follow Joseph on Instagram at Rev Joe T. This has been the one I heard this podcast, and we will see you guys next week. Bye.